Hello, everybody, and welcome back to DD Radio. I am the Manly Stanley Standpy, and of course, as always, joined by my fellow hosts, Kay and and Logan. That's right. So, uh, as we mentioned in the last jump, we are getting into some philosophy today. So, Logan, lay it on us, brother. What are we talking about today? What are today's topics? All right. So, uh, our main topic is going to be Plato's metaphor of the light in the cave. And by extension, because this is where it comes from, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Plato's Republic. So, for our uninformed listener and members of uh, the <laughs> and members of the <laughs> chat who may not know exactly what these entail, do please give us a, a brief summary. Okay, so let's see if I can I can do this justice. The metaphor of the light in the cave. Imagine you are chained up in a cave, and you are facing a wall, and behind you. And far up, there's a light that's shining. And what you see in this cave is simply the shadows on the wall. And this is your world. You don't know anything else about it. To you, the shadows are everything. That That is you. That is your world. Now, he describes the philosopher, Plato describes the philosopher as a man who breaks free of these chains and is able to ascend this cave, getting closer and closer to that light of truth. But the closer you get to that light, you're blinded by it. And so the philosopher in climbing towards it is, is blinded to everything else. And if he were to come back down, think about going into, think about coming from a light room and going into a dark room, how you, you're temporarily blinded to everything around you. If I can just interrupt, what you're mm-hmm. describing me is literally like the scene from The Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> Gotta get out. <laughs> I don't even remember that. Like it was probably a Bane. Off. It is Bane who who's born in the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. He ascended from the darkness. That's, oh, was, actually, was yeah, that's in it. like yeah, this is like <laughs> you describing me is it like uh, you describing it is like reminding me of that movie where it's like, you know, they have to Bruce Wayne had to get out the fucking prison and shit and right. now, not so... wear a rope, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Soap on a rope. Now, so if, if I can continue where you're at, you know, part of that coming back down, once you're aware that the shadows on the wall are just shadows and they're not really there, the other aspect of this is that if you were not the only person in that cave uh, sharing the information that everything that you've seen is not real... Or it's, it's been a misperception, especially if you were able to leave the cave and see the actual world. Uh, this rattles people, and it, it becomes a question of, of leaving their comfort zone uh, and, mm-hmm. and being forced to and face And the thing reality. is, the philosopher, yeah, the philosopher, in his temporary blindness, and even after covering, he can sort of see around in the cave and, and know that, you know, he's looking, he's looking at something closer to the truth. He seems crazy in comparison to, you know, his fellow men in there that you know they don't they don't understand where it is he's coming from because they haven't gotten close to that light so it's it's sort of like this dilemma that he he tries to make a case for you know a philosopher king in that situation that you know he's the one who if anyone can can help break others free of the chains and help humanity ascend towards that light right the pursuit of truth and Ultimately, see, yeah. see, see, see what I mean? Like, uh, Bane came out of that prison, right? <laughs> and what did he do? He rallied up troops. <laughs> troops. It was like, and he was like, hey, y'all are fucking lying, and y'all need to speak the truth in front of that justice hall or whatever, the court. Mm hmm. <laughs> this is like, this is describing. I give Bane's your city story. back to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying, dude. It's like this is describing the story of Bane <laughs> in the Dark Knight Rises. Bane is a hero. Like, this is the comparison. This is the comparisons that I'm making. <laughs> this is metaphor right now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's definitely worth noting. Um, but yeah, so so what is our prompt for discussion this week on this subject of the light in the cave, and how does it tie into the Republic later? Or will we save the Republic for after? Um, I mean, I kind of just wanted to talk about it and just the, the metaphors, sure, you know, sure. what people think about that. Like, um, you know, what, what's your, your journey with this, your, your journey towards this light? How, how have you experienced it? Boy, is this about to get real? Um, so the, for me as a person, truth is, is something that exists, even though there are 
perceptions that are re- your reality, right? Your perception is your reality. I still believe beyond perception, there are things that are factually true. That there is a truth to a situation, no matter how you slice it, there are certain things that just are true. And if Mm -hmm. you wish to live a life that is, I believe, lived properly, it is to avoid ignorance when possible. Obviously, when dealing with somebody like Plato, who follows Socrates, whose entire penchant was, hey, you, you don't know anything. Everybody knows nothing. So, you know, with that as the the core of the philosophy, challenging one's own perceptions is important. And if I'm not mistaken, the the light in the cave, the philosopher, uh, when he comes back and is considered crazy, is killed by the others. And this is a, a reference to Socrates being killed because of his own revelations being deemed, you know, really just bad for the society. And so they, they voted to have him killed. So it becomes a question of, does the bearer or bringer of truth, by forcing people to face discomfort, put themselves in jeopardy? And also, is it something that you should do? Should you tell people the truth? Should you make people know things? I think a lot of it comes down to whether or not someone's ready. I mean, for me, and this is this is going to get a little personal. Um, you know, as as you both know, uh, my last relationship was something where I lived in a complete falsehood and. When I felt uncomfortable and I had issues within the relationship, I still wanted to understand why and what was happening, and I wanted to get to the truth of things. And so when you know, when a relationship's not working out, you can walk away. But I think for me, the important aspect in, in all life, if something's not working, you should not find out, not just say it's broken, you should ask, why is it broken? So for me, that meant a lot of digging and a lot of searching. And the truth was very uncomfortable. I found out that you know, the person I was with for over a year was dating someone else the entire time that also did not know about me. And I took it upon myself to reach out and confirm this with them. And not both of us were enlightened together, but we were both comfortable enough with accepting the truth so long as we were able to find evidence that we could believe in, that we were able to, you know, ultimately move forward with that information and not live in denial. Uh, I think those who deny others the truth are some of, you know, the, the most underhanded and often unforgivable. Uh, if there is a timer on truth, if it's something that can be revealed at a certain point once someone is ready, that's a little different. But a, a truth that will never be revealed, that is an essential truth, that is important for people to know because they, their lives and the choices they make would be based on a falsehood, that is where I think it becomes an issue. And so I believe that it's important to know all of the information because as much as information is like they say ignorance is bliss – Which is more beneficial, having people ignorant or having people who have the conscious knowledge? I mean, once you know something, you can't not know it. But is it, you know, it's it's for some people, it's better they don't know? Maybe. But for me, I believe that I'd rather know and be upset and have my life changed than live in the darkness forever. That's my take on that. Mm -hmm. But you, Kay? Dude, I have no idea. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm still stuck on bait. My right bait now. or your body? <laughs> I'm just like, man, this is like so much like the Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so man. Like, there's half truth and full. Like, yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> How about you, Logan? I mean, you, you brought us the prompt, so I'd like to hear your take on it. Um, So, I don't know. I'd say my. my um way of, 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 you know, placing that, that metaphor over my life is um, it's a little bit different than yours. Probably, uh, I guess it is personal, but personal in a, a different way. It's not so much, I don't think of it in terms of uh, a relationship with a person, but maybe as a relationship uh, with self and the universe, like sure. a spiritual sort of one. So, I mean, I can remember from a young age, like, um, I never... I never really bought into any religion. I guess you could say even from a very early age, I was probably, I guess you would say I was agnostic. Like I was open to the idea, but to me, it was almost like the I, the idea of hoping I don't make anyone angry right now, but the, the idea of, you know, this, this man up in the sky or this, this God that was like a man in the sky that kind of just, you know, you know, knows everything and is, is like us almost I, that, that almost seemed to me silly. Like, like Santa Claus almost like it was just something that, you know, I didn't really believe in though. I, I kind of went along with the, with what I considered a lie with other people because it's just, it's, 
it's almost kind of taboo to, to say that. Not so much now, but then in the area I was, like it, it would have been, especially in, in my household, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as I got older, I kind of went like full on hardcore atheist. And then it, things started changing later as I started, you know, delving deeper into philosophy and, um, you know, books on spirituality where I, I, I feel like I have kind of ascended towards a greater truth. Mm-hmm. And the thing I find funniest is that um, every time I, I'm reading a particularly thought-provoking book, something that I feel gets gets closer to that ultimate truth of reality, I, I sort of understand what Plato was getting at and that, you know, you're blinded by it. It's, it's almost like... Uh, almost like a feeling of elation like oh i understand it now i I understand it and you know you have these moments where you do grasp it a glimpse of you know this this greater truth and it's not there for long but it's there and then it's gone and while you have it you know i'll i'll think about when i I talk with certain people like i know i've talked about about it with you and Kay, and and you guys pretty much comprehend it but you know i've tried to talk to the wrong people about it and they kind of like look at me right <laughs> they don't get it they just I, i'm probably coming off as some kind of cuckoo guy <laughs> and right uh, kind of like kind of like you were saying about how the, the philosopher then seems dangerous i understand like well we live we live in a good society that you know nothing's going to come of it now but you know you, you say something to the wrong person and you know you don't know which hunt? how they're going to react which so, hunted heresy <laughs> yeah exactly confess like, woman yeah. Confess. We, we we had the we had this discussion before, kind of like to take it back a bit, the conversation back where you were talking about like you know how you became like a uh, a time where you became like kind of like a hardcore atheist. We we had the discussion. It wasn't even like a hardcore atheist. It was just kind of like the things that we went through in life kind of made us go through a phase where we were more like anti God in a sense, where it was kind of like you just wanted there to be kind of a God, so you kind of like hate on it. Yeah, because actually, that's, that's kind of true. It was it was more like an anger with 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 what was going on at, at, in our lives at the time. Like we had this discussion, I think, in a car somewhere. You, you wanted to find somebody yeah. to blame it on that because something exactly. was happening. Yeah, and and who better than an omnipotent, right? You know what seems like an imperfect world, but I mean, I I don't think that now. I I think. Yeah. I think the world is perfect as it is, problems and all, because you need you need conflict for growth, you need problems to solve. But um, yeah, I mean, as far as this this light of truth goes, I always come back with a little more knowledge every time. I I imagine I fall because I come back into the darkness, raving mad like a lunatic, and mm-hmm. people give me these funny looks, and then I realize I gotta I gotta rein that in and kind of um, not be so. You know, so much of a philosopher and blend in. And I feel like every right. time I come back, no, I, so, I come so it's back. It's like as... a saying. Yeah, it's like a saying. It's like you know, it's it's good that you're honest, but there's also a problem where if you're too honest, yeah, it's know, it's like, not even. A, yeah, I just I I tend to um, not lie, but not tell everyone the whole truth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's certain situations that call for you telling someone like a half truth, like a, you know, like. Did, did my son die right. fighting or whatnot? Yeah, no, me. your son died a coward. Like, no, like, there's some, like, like a Band-Aid, I guess. Sometimes you got to rip it off gently. Sometimes you just got to rip it off. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Yeah, and I think that um, a lot of it has to, in my opinion, this sort of thing is you have to give people the freedom to make the decision to be enlightened because mm-hmm. they will reject it or be attacked by it if it's something they don't welcome into themselves. And this, I feel this way about religion. I feel this way about spirituality, about philosophy, any subject that requires somebody to be provoked because it's, it's called thought provoking because it's, it's provocative and, and provocative things can have very negative consequences. So, you know, the person has to be in a good state of mind. In the Jewish religion, you know, Kabbalistic study is not permitted until you're 40 years old, at least according to like what I've heard in the past. So this is a point where the person has to be mature enough and have lived enough of a life that they can grasp and accept these mystical properties of, of Judaism. Right. And it's similar in, in other faiths as well. It's you have to you have to reach a certain level before you're able to access like the next, I guess, selection of material that you can try to, to consume for yourself. 
you know, we can, we can talk all day about like how the religion of science is like stepping away and then ultimately it'll just prove other things to be correct that people figured out just by questioning existence rather than questioning the science of existence, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, that's definitely the light in the cave. I, I talked about a real world example, but I definitely am in agreement with you. And I think for me as well, when it comes to, I look at my perception as being in a cave at all times. And people like to use the, the like, you know, stay woke, fam. Like, being woke is yeah. being out of the cave. Like, that's the that's the whole idea. You know, you have to look beyond I, I would the say, perception. I, I would say that being woke is more like being pain, so you see more than just... Because yeah. I, I feel like if you were to get out of the cave, that, that would almost be to, to cease to exist. Because it's like, if you, if you knew, if you solved the mystery, meaning the big mystery which is what i equate with getting out of the cave okay then you that would be it just right because you just reach the end it's like i said about conflict being necessary sure you know problems to solve things to figure out things to learn mm -hmm. that's that's what keeps us going i think if i think if, if you if you were to solve that that would be it certainly and you'd find suffering if if you need a citation once again biblical reference look at king solomon who supposedly went mad once he became all knowing and wise as a philosopher king he had no one he could talk to and everything made him miserable until he found comfort in god i guess so yeah or that's if you get out the cave you end up becoming bane bane and you uh <laughs> break batman's back if you if you want to be Bane, I guess go ahead and be Bane. If you don't want to be Bane, uh, get back in the cave. And then they're gonna think you're crazy. They're gonna suck to get out of the cave just to get beaten by the bat. Yeah, they're gonna you're, you're gonna come out of that cave and they're gonna think you're crazy and they'll start calling you Mad Max. <laughs> <laughs> it just, oh. just depends on what Tom Hardy you want to be. <laughs> so right on. So now let's go into the Republic. Now that we've talked a little bit about the light in the cave. So, uh, in the Republic, Plato kind of, uh, perfect city, and he goes into immense detail. This, this is most of what the Republic is. The, the light in the cave is actually just a very small part. Mm -hmm. It's just a very famous part, and one I, I particularly really like. But the Republic is this perfect city where everything works perfectly. However, um, the thing about Plato is people aren't sure, scholars at least, they're not sure how seriously you're supposed to take Plato in, in his, you know, outlining of this city and whether he actually wants you to think it's perfect or not, because there are problems with it. For example, uh, one thing that really bugs me as a writer is that he talks about having the need to kick out poets, mm -hmm. such as um, Homer, for example. The Iliad and the Odyssey, that's, you know, that's loved by many. That's one of the cornerstones of, of, you know, Greek mythology. Everyone loves the healing. Yeah. The Battle of Troy and the Tale of Odysseus. And he says that these are bad things in the Republic because, you know, it, it instills certain emotions in people that wouldn't be good to the, the common good of the Republic. You know, it, it's it's um, about individualism. And at least in, uh, in our country, individualism is, is pretty highly valued. But when you think of... Uh, you know, elevating an entire society, that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So he talked about, you know, kicking out those kind of philosophers and, and only keeping stories or at least editing them to make it fit a certain narrative so that, you know, everyone thinks a certain way. Everyone has the same ideals. You know, mm -hmm. everyone's basically got the same goal in mind. I mean, on the one hand, that's admirable. And on the other hand, it's kind of scary. Sure. That, you know, you, you lose yourself in this, this greater thing. Become an ant hive or an ant colony instead of uh, instead of people. Mm -hmm. On the whole, though, I mean, it seems like the society would work like a wood. Mm. Just you have to consider what kind of price you're paying for that. Right. Well, it's it's a long-standing thing. Like with every societal contract that you enter, you sacrifice certain freedoms in exchange for the the social contract that you're signing up for. So, example, you know, if you sign up for for you know, you want the security of living in a community with law enforcement, things like that. That also means you have to pay taxes, and it means that you can't do everything you want on your property because you have to have conscious, you know, consideration of your neighbor's property, and you can't just take things. You know, so those are the kind of aspects of the social contract. But then once you get deeper into it and you start looking at, you know, for conformity, you give up personal freedom, and 
you know, America, freedom, yeah, Amer- American gods, we're free anyway. Uh, <laughs> you know, the idea of being free and, and being yourself, uh, especially in the arts, and this really comes down to the arts, because we have more things in terms of media and consumption of goods because people have tastes, right? There are, like, dozens of extra brands of detergent, all owned by the same parent company, but they make these different ones because people like to have the individual choice. And so mm-hmm. I was talking with a uh, former, I don't want to say former Marine, because once a Marine, always a Marine, as they say, but uh, a retired Marine who was describing the different options that you have in an American store versus when he was in Russia. And he said, you know what, uh, what, you know how many options you have for your different shampoos, body wash, and so on in the Russian supermarket? One. You have one bar, a lilac-scented bar of soap. And if you don't like that scent, you're out of luck. And that's all you get, because that's the only choice. And everybody uses it. So I just thought that was interesting, because you know, that's a society where something like that kind of choice seems so trivial, they just remove the choice entirely. And it's still functional. You know, it's not a required choice, but people like to have their taste. Having, like, the illusion of choice often gives people a sense of, of liberty. And, you know, look at, like, a classic video game. You know, will you go and save the princess or, or save our kingdom? And you have, like, yes or no. But then you hit, you hit no and it goes, but you must. No. But you must. No. But you must. And finally you have to click yes. Unless it's a game that lets you actually say no, like Golden Sun lets you say no, and uh, some other ones as well. <laughs> so, you know, that's something to keep in mind. The illusion of choice combined with actual, like, you know, do we have choice? And As you said, like, if everybody's yeah. thinking the same way, I mean, we, we kind of approach that with the death of languages, and that's the whole point of MGS5, but it's it's important because how you speak is how you think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... And I had, this, I had this discussion with you, too, before, Logan. Uh, it was, a, like, individual consciousness and all that kind of pretty much like because there's so many people in the world and each one thinks differently you're you're never gonna have like a perfect society Mm. yeah i mean it's like you're gonna be damned if you yeah there's it's it's like that saying was like life is pi for me it's like okay the pi since it's a non-repeating number each represents an individual person with the individual thought process okay and Mm -hmm. due to that it's like you know you're not going to have – it's going to be like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Well, yes, but I'm going to take this um, eye metaphor you just used, and I'm going to dispel the illusion of uh, you know, freedom of choice and individuality because, like, you guys know me. As a writer, I typically take pride in individuality, but when you zoom out far enough, you realize that, you know, each each one of those – different numbers after that that three in pi sure they're, they're each their own number but they're all part of pi yeah so everything is still one whole when you get down to it original idea yeah theory. yeah our, um, you know when you scale it down to our lives yeah sure individuality see, seems important but when you just keep zooming out and you see the earth no you see no one no thing. like when you zoom you... out from there you see a you know solar system and the galaxy and so on and so forth yeah that's what i'm saying i mean like in order for it to, everything to be perfect, everyone needs to become like one part of the pie, the original state. Mm-hmm. But as well, the way it's going right now, it's just constantly repeating different, repeating uh, different numbers right. until we get reached to that one point of one. Well, I think we already are at pi. It's a constant state of being. It's just that we yeah. individually recognize that we are different, and once mm-hmm. we stop doing that, like if it. I like to refer to myself as like there's there's like me and then there's like the emotional me and then there's the objective me that tries to remove myself and be detached when I think and base it purely on logical things and so like these multiple components of myself I can st- step back and say like nothing I do is more important than what someone else over there does because they're we're both people and then we're both just things within the universe so um, you know we are all part of pi already and each number notice some of the numbers like there are you know three point one four one there's two ones in that list. There are, you know, two people who are similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are two people that are similar, but, like, once again, like, um, it's non-repeating or whatnot. Sure. And... It is diverse. Like, it's diverse. No, no, and, and that's and that's kind of like how society is as well. It's like, you know, you have those the numbers that are the same in that format, in, in the pie format. It's just kind of like their own, like, society that thinks alike, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, that's definitely true. So, like, tribalism, yeah, yeah. 
you know, you stick to your to the group that right. you think you're you're thinking aligns with. Right. I mean, that's the reason we have states and parties, you know, in America, because it's yeah. that you're supposed to be able to move to a place that whose laws and and whatnot fit more your specifics. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's. I think it becomes a question of how much of a macrocosmic society do you care about to make the Republic real for you? Because yeah. it can exist. I know different you know forms of communism, also different forms of like small socialism. I know the Israelis have things like the kibbutz, which is a, a, a living community that is essentially a microcosmic example of functioning socialism or communism, where you know everything within is provided within everybody sort of has you know it's a communal dining hall it's it's very much a self-sustained community but eventually they they seem to be having some struggles too so mm-hmm. you know it's just kind of interesting to to see like i think the more that we include in a in a click right because even like a friend group you go to a party and you, do you hang out with the entire party or do you tend to break off and hang out with a couple of people? Do you float by yourself? I mean, these are all different things. And, and whatever you identify yourself with is your republic until you move on to another one. And you can mm-hmm. slip and slide between and, and them. <clears throat> you can look at, like, uh, I forgot what documentary I was watching. I think it was uh, something on Netflix about Rome. It, it kind of deal with the, the emperor that was blamed for the fall of Rome. Um he fought in the gladiator like he was he fought as a gladiator as well. Um they were talking about how the city of Rome at its highest like in the like the peak of its um na- uh city it had like a population of at least 1 million. For for a city that far back to have a population of 1 million is what essentially led it to led to its downfall because it couldn't sustain that much that many people within the system. I mean, the system was working great when it was under um, a smaller populace, but once it reached that capacity, it essentially became what brought it down. Right. Now they say trim the fat, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Be it. I mean, anything can have like excessive wear and tear on on the, something that you've established, and you know, yeah, the... yeah. I mean, I mean, like now, if you look at like cities now, it's like one million is like nothing. <laughs> There's three of three million people living just in the city of New York, and it's just like, yeah. I mean, but at the same time, our whole world is interconnected as is. Yeah. You know, but even then, the distribution of resources isn't you know consistent throughout. So, for every sustaining and an exceptionally you know successful city, there's another one that's a starving settlement. You know, mm-hmm. sort of a balance issue. But it's just a matter of the luck of the luck of the draw. And I think yeah, the concept of you know, if you do have that radical poet in your society, you do run the risk of your society changing because they do incite change with thought-provoking creations. So it becomes a matter of if you want your republic to remain consistent, you must eliminate anomalies and things that will pull away from it. But if you want it to stay the same, you know, you're good. Just uh, if you want it to, if you do want it to change, if you're cool with it being dynamic then yeah, let people do what they want. But at what point are they going too far? You know, at what point do they defy Mm -hmm. to a point? Like, you know, Socrates was killed. Why? Because he went too far. And so they didn't want him around anymore. And he accepted that fate because he believed it was, it was the, you know, as a democracy, that was what it was right. So that's, uh, for me, that uh, that wraps up the Republic. I don't know about you guys, where you at? No, 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 not good. (laughs) All right, cool. No, that's, that's about, you know. Yeah, so... Yeah, that was uh, there was a take on some brilosophy. <laughs> Thank you once again, Logan, for bringing in the material. As always, uh, definitely, I think it's important for people to dabble in in creative and critical thinking, just for the sake of being able to question things. I mean, that's what they want us to do with with schooling. You know, they want people to become critical thinkers. There's a point where thinking pushes to an extreme where you then are unable to take action, but never thinking when you act. Also yeah, exactly. leads to it's like how you know, far do you dive into the rabbit hole? Right. So you really have to take a little of both, but yeah. you know, being able to think and even go through some sort of dramatic challenge that that pushes you to your limits, if you can then suddenly remove yourself from that challenge after you're done and reflect on what it meant to you, that's where the philosophy comes in and and you can reshape your life. I mean, we as people often have certain core things that will be consistent, but we are ever-changing, right? As as Bruce Lee wrote a note to himself, 
about a person who is constantly trying to actualize who he is and is ever changing. You know, the person who he is writing this letter versus the person he is reading it later won't be the same. So let yourself uh, challenge things once in a while. <laughs> That's enough rambling from me. Anybody else want to have some closing notes before we uh, close out the show? Be water, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Live in the now. Understand that what comes from outside and projects onto you, there's also something. <laughs> what was that last bit? There's also something. Yeah. Understand that, you know, there's things from outside projecting onto you and there's things from inside yourself projecting onto you. You are a blank slate. Ever changing. You are what the situation dictates. Mm. Very cool. has changed. <laughs> <laughs> ID tag philosophers carry ID tag poetry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So thank you everybody once again for joining us on DD radio. Uh, it's been a lot of fun as always catching up with the bros and just talking about stuff. Uh, this is the manly Stanley Stanpi joined by the two wonderful co-hosts. We have hey. first up. Okay. That's right. And also Logan. And once again, this is DD radio. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed the show, please make sure to Click like and subscribe on the channel, and as always, stay tuned for more content here on the Manly Stanley Stand Pie channel. Have a good one, everybody.